Welcome to the Polari Podcast with me, Sophia Blackwell. And me, Paul Burston. So, Paul, we're here to talk about the last stop before we get to the prize ceremony on the evening of Saturday, October 30th. And that last stop took place in Scotland at the Scottish Poetry Library with Barbara Brownskirts, Ian Morrison, Shane Strachan and Fiona Mosley. Now, the main question that I'd like to ask you about the event is obviously it took place in Scotland. So was it completely Baltically freezing? It wasn't. It was actually really mild. So I went to Glasgow for five days and then I went from there over to Edinburgh where we did the show. And Glasgow was a little bit chillier than Edinburgh, but they were both, it, was, it wasn't too cold. Um, I was ex- I, I, whenever I go to Scotland, I always brace myself for it to be really cold. <laughs> My mum is from Edinburgh, so I have many memories of family holidays going up to Scotland from Wales, where I grew up, and um, we had a really fantastic, fantastic time. It was it was one of those events where, because of the situation with COVID and, you know, different um, rules in different parts of the country or and different countries, you know, for example, on the train going up to Glasgow, very few people were wearing masks. And then when we crossed the border, there's an announcement telling you you have to put a mask on, and suddenly everyone puts a mask on. And you think, well, you've just spent four hours in the same carriage with these people. What's the point of putting it on now? So, yeah, it was all kind of strange. And we didn't know whether the event would be able to go ahead until quite late in the day. We didn't know how many people would come. It was the first event at Scottish Poetry Library since the arrival of COVID, the first physical event. So, Paul, when we started this tour in October last year, the podcast captured Polari events that were completely physical then a mixture of online and physical events, then completely online events, then a mixture, and now we're back to physical events again. It's been a bit of a roller coaster to say the least. What would you say that you've learned during that time? Oh my God, God I've learned a lot. Um, one thing I've learned really is that I think challenges often contain opportunities. And one of the things that we've managed to sort of turn to our advantage in a way is that by doing events at least with one part of your head thinking about an online version whether it, whether you're doing a live event physically in person and then you're going to use some of that in a podcast or in a youtube video it means that you can reach people that wouldn't otherwise have been able to attend and we certainly discovered that with some of our polari online events both the salon events which were more kind of chat show format, and also the workshops that Karen McLeod ran, because people that attended both of those often said that they'd never been to an event before because it wasn't accessible to them or it wasn't in their part of the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one of the things I think I've learned is, is to sort of bear that in mind going forward, that I think going forward there's going to be a kind of hybrid model I think, really, for Polari, because I think that's the best way to reach as wide a range of people as possible. If and when, well, as and when we come out of this current situation, there are still going to be people who uh, feel more cautious about returning to crowded physical venues than others. And I think one has to bear that in mind. So I think I think going forward, there's going to be a mixture of of both um, in-person physical events and also online events and podcasts and digital events and YouTube videos and so on. I think I think it's a mixture of all those things will come together in the future. I'm not 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 just for, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that'll just happen for me. I think that'll happen for lots of live performances. I think whether it's theatre shows or book launches. Yeah, it's an interesting point about who does and doesn't feel comfortable about coming to Polari. In a way, because you've been touring with Polari for almost a decade, you probably have a unique insight into the data and the demographics of people who actually come to the show. And you and I have spoken about how we sometimes get slightly different audiences when we're in different towns or when we're at library gigs. And there are obviously some parts of the UK where people might not necessarily feel comfortable going to an LGBTQ plus event, which is something that I don't always think about, but it's it is clear when you get out to certain parts of the country that things are obviously not quite the same as, as they are in London, which is always worth remembering if you're an event organiser. Yes, and, and, and you also have people that are happy to attend an event where they may be seen by their neighbours or their friends or what, whatever, and other people that, that just, you know, they're not, they're not as comfortable around that. And there are still those pockets, actually not even pockets, I think it's, got, I think it's more widespread than, than we maybe like to believe. Um, there are a lot, all kinds of reasons why people may be more comfortable attending an event from the privacy of their own home 
than being out in public about it. And I think what you have to respect that. And, you know, if, if people can't come to the event, the event can go to them. And I think that's part of the, the strategy going forward. Yeah, I think we're all thinking a lot about hybrid events and how they can be done meaningfully. So there's a genuine degree of interaction and maybe a bit of something creative or something different. At the moment, I think we're struggling with potentially what that might look like, or at least I am. But I think cultural industries need to engage with that sort of thing. And there are obviously also reasons apart from maybe people not being that secure in people seeing that they're at a queer event or whatever, and also geographical locations. But there's a variety of other reasons why people might be more comfortable engaging with something online whether that's because of travel you know they can literally just boot up an event and go to that or whether perhaps they have caring responsibilities or finances make it difficult for them to go to events or mental health makes it easier for them to turn off a camera and uh, sit in front of an online event all of those things are definitely worth considering and worth potentially building into the future so yeah I'd love to keep on with a sort of hybrid model and to keep on making different forms of art and to keep creating records of what Polari looks like. Of course, the downside of that is that promoters have to work a little bit harder. So we're not potentially creating double the work, but probably about another third of the work for uh, no additional pay, which is a little bit of a shame. And it's obviously difficult to be told that you must suck it up after a couple of really difficult years. I know it's difficult, but for example, I, you know, we made films, uh, I made 50 plus hours of radio during lockdown plus uh, plus these podcast episodes and I think it was really rewarding to actually be able to make something it was certainly a savior for me um, my mental health really improved in the first lockdown as a result of making the radio shows and learning how to make audio and I think it was really important to make something that wasn't necessarily you know more sourdough starters or banana bread especially at a time when all of us felt really powerless and like we didn't know what the next step was going to be. Oh god I mean for me it, it was it was I mean the the first lockdown was incredibly difficult I found I found the beginning of when Covid first arrived I found it incredibly difficult to um to focus on my work I find it very difficult to write and having to find ways of answering the problem of not being able to tour while supposedly touring um, actually provided me with with a way through that because I had to adapt um, and do you know learn how to use iMovie learn how to edit video learn how to storyboard videos which sort of got me in, in a roundabout way back into writing again because obviously there are, there's an overlap there with storyboarding and, and, and structuring stories and even though my brain was very foggy and I couldn't I couldn't find it in myself to write fiction I find it very difficult to write fiction I was able to shape storylines for videos and then through that discipline and daily exercise I guess it sort of steered me back into the writing again so adapting to challenges and yet if you're working in the creative industries it's inevitable you I, th I think you just take it as part of the job that you're always going to be asked to do more for less <laughs> I think it's just it just seems to come with the territory just when you think you're on top of it you suddenly find there's another another layer of work that, you're, that you need to do I mean I was talking to my accountant yesterday about all the new things that are coming in for free for self-employed people in a couple of years just another layer of bureaucracy, another le another layer of work that we have to do. We have to do these quarterly um, tax returns, and you just think, you know, there's the there's there's no no, no creative endeavour goes unpunished. <laughs> Another geeky thing about editing, which, you know, as you can probably tell by the quality of these podcast recordings, I'm still learning. But it's an interesting thing to think about how things like editing audio and film can actually shape your writing. Um, I'd like to think that it's helped my writing process by helping me become a bit more concise. I'm currently working on a non-fiction project. And, for example, it's helped in shortening my sentences and making me a little bit more exact. You know, you try and nail the beats first time round. Another weird thing is that now whenever I watch TV or listen to the radio or whatever I can actually tell where the edits are which isn't off-putting I'd find it really exciting but it's something that I'd never actually noticed before do you find that having worked on the video editing for Polari for the YouTube channel and for other things do you find that that's actually shaped your writing process at all because I'd be really interested to know about that 
Oh, definitely. There's no question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have storyboarded before. I storyboarded The Black Path, um, which was the novel that, I, that came out in 2016. It was my fifth novel. And I storyboarded that because it was such a break from what I'd written before. Before, I'd always just written on the fly. I, I, I just, I just, I'm a pantser, you know. I don't really plot. But for that one, I really had to plot. Even though the, the novel that came out of it didn't stick strictly to the storyboard, having the storyboard there gave me the confidence to move forward with it. So I, it is something I've done before. I, I think this experience has, has sort of focused it a bit more and made it, made it tighter. But that, I think that's because when you're, when you're working on videos for YouTube, you know, there is a sense of urgency around them. There's a sense that people aren't going to engage for longer than a certain duration. So you're very conscious when you're putting them together of how long people's attention spans are, especially last year. People's attention spans last year were not great, you know, for obvious reasons, including my own. So you, you, do, you want to tell the story as quickly and as eff efficiently as possible. Even though you're writing long form fiction, you can still apply those those rules in terms of individual scenes within a novel. So you mentioned one of our all time favourites, Barbara Brownskirt, aka Karen McLeod. As she was part of the very first episode that we did when I interviewed her upstairs at the RVT during the first ever Polari event that uh, we did as part of this tour almost, well, slightly over a year ago, actually, in early October 2020. And she was part of this tour, wasn't she, for most of it? And you two were actually uh, going around together and she was teaching creative writing along with you online. Well, yes, because Karen Karen was my um, touring partner for the sort of physical events that we, that we, we managed to put on. So she travelled to... Um, Brighton she traveled to Manchester and she traveled to uh, Edinburgh and where she performed as Barbara Brownskirt um, who we've had on the podcast before um, and Edinburgh was was great because it was this you know the Scottish Poetry Library you know <laughs> what a triumph for Barbara to, to bully her way on into that venue <laughs> Actually, she was on fire that night, you know. <laughs> People were quite scared. <laughs> and rightly so. Well, yes, obviously Barbara always livens things up. But you also had some other poets uh, as part of this event. Quite heavy on the poets, this bill. Was it the fact that it was at the wonderful venue that is the Scottish Poetry Library? Did that inspire you to put some local poets on your roster? Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I you know, I think... I felt that it would only be only be right for a, an event there to be heavy on on poetry. Um, so we had, apart from Barbara, um, we also had two other poets on the bill, and as, so we had um, Shane Strachan, who I've worked with before. He performed with us in Edinburgh quite some years ago, actually about four or five years ago. He lives in Aberdeen, and we also had an, Ed an Edinburgh-based poet, Ian Morrison who I'd never worked with before, who was fantastic as well. So they, they, were, they were both excellent. I, I, I wasn't familiar with Shane's new work. The last time we worked together, he read prose, and he was fantastic. Fifteenth of February, 1967. In a pub at the top of Ells Court Road, the barmaid's fancy dress suggests we've entered the Edwardian era. <laughs> oh, please, with a fashion-forward press, we'll have no trips to the past, dears. At the start of the show, we are thrown. Who pairs lilac and camel in check? The mushroom shoulders on a plain white dress. We sigh with relief at the trousers caught, rather style in tight anklets. Exotic. We are simply sick of many skirts and feel the pinch on these drafty days. But our lower hemline's here to stay. What novel treatment of traditional tweed, and a distant wife with inverted pleats. And we witness the bad of the kilted suit, a tartan scared and brief bolero, a Macmillan, rainbow, hues. As far flowers and powder blue, we hunt for seed pearls embroidered on coral and cuff. But on a little black ship on the shift, we can't miss the sleeves, huge puff. 
These gay petite clothes are for young, but not kooky clients, who crave individuality. Down in hard-bitten London town we raid. Bill Gibbs' name has been made. <laughs> I hadn't come across Shane Strachan's work before, but a quick Google showed me that he's also a podcaster. He's got two limited podcast series, which you can find on the usual platforms. One of them is called The Bill Gibb Line, which is about the Scottish designer Bill Gibb, who he references in one of the audio snippets as part of this programme. And the other one is a series of stories in Scots called Aura Though It Be, and they all look really interesting. He seems like somebody who turns his hand to quite a few different forms of art. I hadn't come across the work of Ian Morrison either, but I found the poems that are featured as part of this programme very beautiful. I'll definitely be looking up some more of his work. I didn't, I didn't know Ian's work at all. I only what I managed to research online. I'd never met him or, or heard him performing live. He was a fantastic performer, really fantastic. My back cools also in broadening swathes of clan. I can't tell what sign you're making, on your back or facing, away. This all feels right. And now I hear the sea. There was a really great energy because I think because it was the first event at the venue since the, all the lockdowns, two weeks before the event, we had about 10 ticket sales, I think. It was very small. And then on the day of the event, on the afternoon, myself and Fiona Mosley, who was also on the bill and also lives in Edinburgh now, we went on Radio Scotland and the host of the show really got it she really and she really she'd really done the research and really knew what knew what Polari was all about what the prize was all about and really bigged us up and I don't know how much impact that had but the event was packed out it was absolutely chocker in the end which was fantastic it was a wonderful way to end the the touring event sort of on a high like that because after Brighton which was such a great event it I was I was almost anticipating it being a bit of a let down you know the expectations were lower just because of the numbers we were expecting and in the end it turned out to be a really packed event with a really fantastic energy people were really really buzzing it was fantastic really wonderful Ooh, it was love at first sight when you dragged me down at the bottom of the deep blue sea unleash this genius tie-dye rainbow slick with that viscous liquid in me you watch me undress witness time decompress heated treated refined oh yeah <laughs> now I'm here, do not stress. Just give your whip a crack, sit back and relax and watch this weak dream like a favour dean, like a Dave's ex machina, a god in the machine, saving the granite city for another tragic scene. <laughs> but now I'm not your question about them little spells and leaks. It's really best we keep out between you and me. If you want that to <laughs> yes, he's a, he's, a re he's a really interesting writer and he's got lots of different um, different strings to his bow. He does lots of different things. So, But he's also somebody who works in different mediums. So, you know, he's worked a lot around drag performance and, and other types of performance other, other than just spoken word. So... There's different elements and music as well, live music. So there's different elements that come into the work. And I think it really comes through in the performance, actually. You can, you can, you can tell this person is versed in other disciplines. I mean, I'm the toilet, but can't quite be bothered getting up yet, please. <laughs> and then you hear your flatmate going to the toilet and you're angry at them, but also at yourself, because it's not their fault that you waited too long. <laughs> What's a place that felt like yours? Well, the first place you would think of is an easy go-to, my bed, both in my home in Dundee and in Dunbar. A place where someone may have to knock to get in, whatever I'm doing there, which is usually just lying there. Well, as I said before, obviously it's not nice to sleep all day if you have nothing to do, but it's kind of nice to have that without someone getting at you for it. I know it's bad, but you've rules that you've set yourself. I always feel slightly uncomfortable being a visitor that something could go wrong. Can you think of a place that you felt safety and happiness? I mean, I think there's multiple. I mean, that's the issue, isn't it? A set of conditions for the place. What was the time you felt like those things came together for you? 
I think you're home. A horrible drunken night in the city. I did mention feeling safe there, in those walls, a sense of security. Comfortable even with having your depression. I think I'm someone that can go somewhere and settle quite easily. Adjust in my head that I'm there, get bored of one location quickly, so a new location is quite refreshing. As long as I'm there, and no one's trying to change some there, then I'm happy. Does that not make much sense? What are the threats to finding those places? In finding, or to finding? Both, probably. Other people trying to take you away from that space. Money, if you can't travel to that space. Big plush pillows, I'm kidding. A sex dungeon. Don't write that, are you writing that? <laughs> Two veggies. Did I make you up? With, I guess, I even struggle with people sleeping in my bed. What? I like it, just me. Well, you insulted my space. It smelled of cigarettes. I am a smoker, so you're very good at not smoking in my space. I got made fun of for that. You have to go outside by the skips to smoke, haha. <laughs> But he has to stay in his space and poison his dog. It doesn't do anything to dogs, really. Well, I'm sure you'd like to believe that. Why is it bad for babies? Because babies are human. <laughs> that sounds like selective science to me. Okay. Tell me about the place you'd like to imagine as your place. Oh, goodness. Bjork got offered an island for her good deeds. Her good deeds. She rejected it. A house on a big rock, but the top's a lush green area. That would be quite lovely. I can see why Bjork might not have wanted that. I think solitude's the thing for me. But then, you know, also it's nice to look out of the window and know that you're not the only person in the world. Mosley's first novel, Elmet, and her very different follow-up, Hot Stew, which is out now from John Murray Press, and is definitely worth a read. It's a tale of old Soho under threat from developers, which is a cause that's very, very close to our hearts, I'm sure. And she's reading a story, a new story, as part of this event, which I found this snippet really fascinating. She was in two minds about reading it. She was originally going to read from her new novel, Hot Stew, and about a week before, she emailed me and said, would it be OK to read a short story that she was working on? And I said, absolutely. And because it's such a personal story and it's about a subject that's not really well understood, she said, well, she said, actually, that, you know, if she couldn't read it at Polari, where could she read it? Because it, it feels like a safe space in which to read something that has so much personal... Um, this, there are lots of autobiographical elements in that story, so she was understandably cautious about sharing it. Um, and she read it beautifully, and the audience really, really responded to it really well, and it gave her a real boost. Um, she sent me the, the full story to read afterwards, and I've read it. It's, it's absolutely wonderful, really wonderful piece of work. Dr Law had seen Mary before for depression and had prescribed a course of cytolopram. Her first question was about mental health, and Mary replied with some lies about how good she'd been feeling. She stopped taking the drugs not because she was happy, but because they dampened the emotional attack of empathy and made her cruel. But she couldn't be bothered to go into it now. She said she had a physical issue, and Dr Law invited elaboration. Mary often rehearsed difficult conversations in her head before she had them, but although she'd been foreseeing this moment for years, she'd been unable to build a discursive litany. She lacked the terminology, she lacked paradigms. She mentioned Steve and used his assessment, later considering how strange it was to cite her boyfriend on this topic, but he'd seen more naked women up close than she had. He'd seen several, whereas she'd only seen herself. So when they'd tried to have sex and problems had arisen, she'd asked him to detail his other intimate encounters, feeling a bit like Hedda Gabler on the chaise with Einat Lerfog urging him to entertain her with tales of debauchery she could never herself experience. Dr Law frowned at Mary's rudimentary explanation as if listening to unlikely gossip. She suggested an examination, and Mary undressed behind the curtain. She pulled down her jeans and knickers, rolled them into a tight ball and placed them on a chair. She climbed onto the bench. The plastic stuck to her skin and squeaked as she settled herself, feet together, knees apart. Dr. Law's hands were cold, and though she barely made contact, she touched Mary's vulva as if it were an origami sculpture, liable to crumble beneath a misplaced fingertip. Mary wondered at the doctor's reticence. 
She would later discover that other women's cunts were less robust than hers, quivering with pleasure or pain at the, pain at the slightest touch. But lacking this knowledge, she read the doctor's caution as confusion. It must be something beyond her experience, something she couldn't comprehend. The assessment was brief. Mary put her clothes back on and the doctor and patient sat down together on the chairs by the desk. There were further examples of infantilising imagery around the room, jolly, furry creatures issuing instructions about head lice and chlamydia. <laughs> <laughs> Dr Law said she would refer Mary to a consultant gynaecologist. She looked up a list of those practising at nearby hospitals. Waiting times varied and she selected the one who'd be able to see Mary soonest, then began to dictate a letter that would be typed up by her secretary. Mary listened as the doctor tried to explain her situation, stumbling in the same places that she had stumbled, likewise describing her anatomy according to the functions it could and could not perform. Several times she returned to Mary for clarification. You menstruate? Yes, but my periods are very painful. Mary didn't know if that last part was relevant. But you can't use tampons. Mary shook her head to confirm, then silently conducted an appraisal of whether nodding would have been more appropriate to corroborate a negative clause. And you obviously can't have sex at all. Mary paused. Later, much later, she would realise that she could have sex, that she'd been having sex in various styles for years. But in the doctor's surgery in the spring of 2007, having just turned 19, she confirmed that she could not have sex at all. Mary was first sexually aroused when she was five years old. She first masturbated to orgasm when she was 11. She didn't know the word orgasm, nor did she know the word clitoris, but she knew that rubbing herself in a particular way felt good. She also knew to keep quiet about it. She got the impression from bawdy schoolyard, di schoolyard dialogues that boys engaged in an activity called wanking, mm -hmm. but girls didn't. She wasn't a boy, obviously. So what she was doing couldn't be that, and even the word seemed more applicable to boys than to girls. Besides, she viewed what she was doing as a temporary activity, a placeholder until the commencement of real sex, by which she meant full, penetrative sex. There are still certain topics within the areas around gender and sexuality which are still sensitive or, or even taboo, even within our community. And, you know, the more people talk about those experiences and those feelings, and those identities, um, the better, because that's how we all learn from each other. And it, but it, but it does take courage to to share some of those stories, because there's always that fear of, not well, not 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 so much rejection, but although I guess that's probably part of the fear, but not being understood or being misunderstood. It's a brave piece of writing, and it was a brave thing to to share it um, with a live audience like that. I think only a couple of people had read it before, so to, to read it in front of you know a full library is is a daunting prospect. You know what it's like when 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 you when you share new work anyway. I mean, it's always daunting to share new work in front of an audience. The first time the first time you read a piece of work in front of an audience is terrifying, frankly. Once you've done it once, and you've had you've had some positive feedback, then it gives you the confidence to go on and, and do it again. But if if the piece you're reading is also very personal I think that makes it more challenging because you, you you feel you feel exposed on so many different fronts then it's not just the work it's also you that that you're exposing yourself it feels like because it's your the work is close to you so it's a, it's a, it's a brave and difficult thing to do um, and she she did it fantastically she did it really beautifully so, Paul, the Polari Prize announcement is approaching at the time that we record this. Are you looking forward to returning to your old spot at the South Bank Centre? Because it must have been over a year, surely, since we were last there. I'm really excited. I mean, it's actually been, I worked out it's been 20 months since I was last on stage at the South Bank Centre. We were last there in February 2020. So it's been more than 18 months. 20 months um it's a little bit daunting it does feel a bit daunting to be going back to a venue you've not been at because I, I was i was there so often you know usually i'm there so often so i'm really excited about being back and i'm really excited about the the prize announcement we've got a really great bill as well so it's going to be a really fantastic evening 
and also it's Halloween weekend, so there's not that I need an excuse, but that's another excuse to dress up. So we'll have fun with that. Stephen Appleby's on the bill, and I know he's planning to wear something outlandish and Halloween themed. So he's the 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 gauntlet's been thrown down there, you know. <laughs> I think Barbara Brownsgood is coming as Karen McLeod just to terrify everybody. That should be scary. I think there'll be a few people that will... A few of the regulars um, will probably dress up a bit. They usually dress up when it's Halloween weekend. Um, I mean, it's very rare for us to be on a Saturday. You know, we're on, a, we're on Saturday night. So I think at the moment, the, you know, people are... You, you can socialise, you know, in certain situations comfortably because you know that, that the right um, provisions are being... Measures are being taken... And South Bank are really good around all of that stuff. So I think it's as a safer space as one can be in, in terms of being in a physical space. But obviously, if, like like you know, like like any um, going into any physical space at the moment does feel a bit daunting and strange. But you know, we we're so out of practice. It'll be interesting to see how. <laughs> well, first of all, how how wearing a mask affects my makeup because that is also a, a consideration. You know, if you're going to do a Halloween makeup job, then you've got a mask on. Is it all going to smudge? Or maybe the mask is the Halloween makeup. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great night. I mean, we've got Nikita Gill, uh, Stephen Appleby, who I mentioned already, Beatrice Hitchman, who is reading from her second novel. She she was shortlisted some years ago for the Ply Prize for her first novel. And we have Andrew McMillan, who was our first ever winner of the Polari Prize for Non-Debuts, which began in 2019. And he's reading from his new collection, Pandemonium. So it's very exciting to have him on the bill from Manchester coming down for the night. And we'll have the, the prize announcements with our two of our judges, um, Susie Fay and Rachel Holmes. So Susie's judging on the, on the panel for the non-debut prize and Rachel's on the panel for the Polari First Book Prize. So they'll be making the announcements of who the each of those winners are at around 8.15, 8.30 tomorrow, on, on Saturday the 30th. So by the time people are listening to this, they'll know who the winners are. Um, but right now, only I know. Well, actually, no, only I and the judges know and RPR. The shortlist... Stephen, Diana and Gonouche are all on the non-debut prize shortlist, along with Caroline Bird, Rosie Garland. Oh, yes, the, the sixth book is The Intoxicating Mr Lavelle by Neil Blackmore. Yeah, and then the Polari first book prize is Rainbow Milk, Paul Mendez, Chard, Andrina Leanne, Forced Out, Kevin Maxwell, he was at the RBT, A Beautiful Boy, Mosin Zaidi, Shuggy Bain, Douglas Stewart, and Swimming in the Dark, Thomas Jadrowski. So we're going to have a quick rundown of some of the shortlisted authors for the Polari Prize and the Polari First Book Prize, which will be announced uh, on the evening of October the 30th at the South Bank Centre. Not all of the shortlisted candidates are being profiled here. That's partly because we didn't get audio footage of all of them, but some of our favourites have appeared more than once as part of the tour. And for those who we didn't get the audio of, they are all so in the running so obviously don't let the snippets here for you these are not the only people who've been nominated for the awards and made it onto the shortlists and if you want to hear more about the full shortlists for the prizes and indeed the earlier long list for the prizes do listen to the Polari Prize preview episode which is a couple of episodes back. So I just wanted to have a little bit of a retrospective of some of the audio that we've collected for this podcast that focuses on specifically our shortlisted authors. One of the most interesting books of the past year and one of the first authors that I profiled on Out in South London is Paul Mendes, whose debut Rainbow Milk is available now from Dialogue Books. It's the story of Jesse who leaves his Jehovah's Witness family and community in the black country in order to find a new life for himself in London. And Paul hadn't done many readings of the book, uh, partly because of lockdown, but he did a terrific job in heaven. So here's Paul with a little snippet and introduction of the story of Jesse and Rainbow Milk. 
So Rainbow Milk is a semi-autobiographical, and I will let you judge how semi and how autobiographical. <laughs> Novel about a young man from a Jehovah's Witness community in the West Midlands, the black country. Um, he's from a Jamaican background, and he is disfellowshipped from his community when they find out he's gay. Um, he moves to London and becomes a sex worker. Um, so I'm going to read from sort of about a quarter of the way in, into the book. Um, at this point, he has been disfellowshipped. It's May 2002, um, and he's at Birmingham train station, having just left home. Jess's alarm went off at seven, but he'd barely slept. He was excited, if nervous. He'd been scared of London all his life, but was a man now, and after a few months saving up, he was ready to do it. He'd found a hostel on the internet in Earl's Court for £12 a night. He had £300 in his bank account and had no responsibilities to anyone. He packed only what he absolutely needed, his best clothes, some underwear, ten or so CDs, his discman, the James Baldwin novel, Another Country. He left his key and his Bible on his pillow. The Bible was supposed to have an answer for everything, but did not have guidance for sons whose families had betrayed them and turned them out. He wanted to tuck its ribbon at a verse that would show his parents what they'd done. The New World translations, fathers do not be irritating your children, did not go far enough and he eventually decided he didn't want to waste any more time inside a book that had made him literate, but told him everything he did and stood for was wrong. He stared at it, closed, leather bound and gold leaf trimmed, for an indecisive moment before he ran downstairs and out of the front door without leaving a note. Kevin Maxwell read from his memoir, Forced Out, which is published by Granter Books at the RVT, which has been a very important venue for us throughout this tour. One of the things that I find interesting about Kevin Maxwell's story is that so many of our stories deal with the idea of exile and leaving home and not being able to be our full, authentic queer selves with our family. Kevin, despite being an openly gay officer and therefore having many other struggles to deal with in the workplace, didn't necessarily have that experience when he came out to his mother. And one of the reasons for that may be that he had another gay sibling. So here's a nuanced take on how Kevin felt about coming out, which is still not straightforward, even if you know your parents are going to be broadly accepting of you. Um, I decided to take some snippets from the reader rather than just bore you, you know, reading page after page. Um, some of it's uh, prior to the police, some of it's about the police, and what well, seven, and some of it's afterwards. So just to give you a flavour of the book and, you know, and my story, this particular story, chapter of my life. On a summer's afternoon, I fell ill and collapsed at Heathrow Airport. At the time, I was working as a detective in the Counter Terrorism Command at London's Metropolitan Police, having transferred as a detective from the Criminal Investigation Department at Greater Manchester Police. Afterwards, my life and how I saw the world around me changed. I began to think about how the culture in policing impacted communities when it came to crime and terrorism and the effect prejudice and discrimination had on staff. I was forced to speak out, but it came with devastating consequences. That's like the opening to the book. And then I um, go into my journey as a gay brown boy in inner city Liverpool. I'm the last of 11 children, by the way, from a um, Catholic family, so imagine how tough that was. <laughs> Just a hand-me-down was bad enough. <laughs> Um, my older brothers shaped my understanding of masculinity, but I also knew I was different then. I was keener on playing doctors and doctors than doctors and nurses. I saw my brothers and their friends with girls, but I was more interested in the boys on my estate. I sensed that my mum knew I was different too, but she never made a fuss about it. I was encouraged to be myself and experiment, even trying on my sister's makeup, often. <laughs> I was never told to stop acting in a certain way, nor forced to play with boys' toys. I was the second of mum's children to be gay. One of my older sisters had come out as a lesbian, and her sexuality caused her much pain and suffering. Mum was determined that I shouldn't feel the same anguish, 
and so I grew up knowing only acceptance of my sexuality. For years, I'd been a big fan of Stephen Appleby's weekend cartoons in The Guardian, which are terrific. I didn't know that he'd also taken on some longer projects, and in fact, his latest project, Dragman, has already been awarded a prize for comics, which is wonderful, especially given that he spoke so candidly on one of our earlier shows about the struggles that he had in writing it and getting it accepted by the editors. In some cases, he thought that, you know, it was completely ready to go, and then he got what every writer feels which is the feedback that, no, you have to rework some of it. So he went away and created something really special, I think. And Dragman is certainly a unique story. It's a story of August Crimp, who is a superhero with a very special alternative superpower. Dragman takes a familiar superhero trope, which is that of a double sort of secret life and this character having these two lives. And also the idea that the costume is empowering, which I think is really interesting. Um, well, yeah, basically, Dragman kind of came into being uh, in 2002 as a character in my Guardian weekly strip. And it was, and, and he was, he, she, I've always called Dragman he, which some people have commented on. But anyway, Dragman always seemed to me to, to be able to, to do more, you know, there, there seemed to be more to the character. Sort of, I, you know, I was closeted. I'd been kind of dressing in women's clothes since the, well, I suppose the late 70s, well, mid 70s, but, but but I was completely kind of secretive because it was one of those things that I was terribly kind of embarrassed about, I, you know, and all of that. Um, so, it, you know, the, the total secret life thing that that was common back in the 70s, 80s. So it just struck me that at one point that that Dragman, who sort of popped into my head as a man who had superpowers when he put on women's clothes, just seemed a lovely parallel with the superhero thing who have secret identities and so on. And I thought I could do, rather than just the odd strip, I could do a whole book exploring the truth of, well, my trans experience, and and also make it entertaining with the superhero side. I mean, this is the first Dragman comic strip, and this was 2002, and it took me, I don't know, what, 18 years or whatever it is, you know, 17 years to get to the point of doing a book. I'd been a fan of Diana Suami for many years, having read her books about Gertrude and Alice and Radcliffe Hall as a little lesbian teenager, which is kind of one of those things that one has to do when growing up gay. And I loved seeing her at the RVT show. Here's a little snippet of Diana talking about her new book from Head of Zeus, which is called No Modernism Without Lesbians. What a great title. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me and thank you all for being real people, a <laughs> real event in a real world. This is what the journalist Janet Slanner wrote in 1926. The world has always had lovers, and yet for thousands of years, with that same amount of energy, society could have stopped war, established liberty, given everybody a free education, free bathtubs, free music, free pianos. Janet Slanner crops up in my book, no modernism without lesbians. It's about creative lesbians who, in the decades before the Second World War, fled the repressions and expectations of their hometowns like Washington and London and formed a like-minded community in Paris. They lived, wrote, published freely, and were at the vanguard of modernism, that shift from 19th century orthodoxies into 20th century ways of seeing and saying. There'd been no community like it since the ancient Greek poet Sappho on the island of Lesbos. Many of them learned Greek to read Sappho's verses, and they wrote their own poems in her honor. I started writing biographies of lesbians 35 years ago. I've written lots of them. This is the last. This is the last. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time a mainstream publisher has wanted the word lesbian. <laughs> Historically, a mother didn't want to hear it. Publishers didn't want to use it. <laughs> so for me, it's a breakthrough to have lesbian in the title, on the jacket, on the spine, in the running. <laughs> it bleaches the word.
word residual shame, to use it as an inclusive common noun and as a positive light to shine on the achievements of the women I write about. One of the great things about Polari is that we get to hear stories from other cultures and the Ministry of Guidance by Golnu Noor, published by Muswell Press, is one of those stories, giving us a glimpse of what it's like to be a modern, young, millennial queer in Iran. There are stories of men, there are stories of women, there are stories of a devout young teenage girl going to visit her brother and realising that he is gay. There are stories of two women getting together when a local famous preacher is being commemorated in his mourning ceremony, but they decide to do something else entirely during that time. And there are stories of music, there are stories of people who want to grow up and write. It's such a vivid, beautiful book, and I completely recommend the Ministry of Guidance if you want to read something a bit different and a bit special. Here's Ganoush reading a non-fiction piece at Heaven, and it is about the joys of airport food. The narrator is basically just me, I'm going to be honest about that. But it's been categorised as fiction, so why of that? Um, it's got transit. The Ukrainian waiter is shouting at me in bad English that my bacon sandwich contains bacon. You sure you want it? No, hello. I feel like answering his idiotic question with another idiotic one. Why do you assume I am Muslim and don't eat bacon? Does my fiery red v-neck shirt and loose hair look like hijab to you? And then I remember it is my dark features. No matter how much skin and hair I put on display, in the eyes of the airport staff, I will always be one thing, a Muslim. I hungrily look around at other customers who are all talking in loud Ukrainian, chuckling with the waiters who are suddenly very welcoming. They are all white. The women are skinny and have long blonde hair. The men are sturdy and have bald heads. The women who push prams look both furious and frustrated. The men all look the same, expressionless. I find most of the boys to be terribly beautiful. They are tall and have large blue eyes, their smooth skin radiating youth, but their belligerent manners ruin it all. My haram sandwich arrives after half an hour and I assume the waiters have taken turns to spit on my Muslim bacon. Turns out they haven't. In fact, I realize this is the most delicious sandwich I have ever eaten. The bacon tastes so fresh, it melts in my mouth. And for those few seconds that my sandwich lasts, I forget how exhausted I am, and I forget about the xenophobic episode. I catch the eye of the waiter, but I avoid leaving any tips. Also, I conclude the sausage sandwiches my dad made me for school were even better than the one I just had. Because they were elaborate, everything was planned and loved before being put inside the baguette. And the mayonnaise was homemade. My dad makes mayonnaise with organic eggs and vinegar and oil. It takes him ages and the whole family is deafened by the cacophony of his blender. But it is the only mayonnaise I like and ever eat. I decide the constant trips to Tehran, which are messing up my body and mind, are worth it. Thank you so much. God news, everyone. So, Paul, in terms of having worked together for just over a year to make these podcasts, would you think of making more podcasts in the future or are you just happy to have got to this point where we can stop for a while? Oh, no, I, I definitely want to do more podcasts. I also want to do, you know, I want to do more Polari events that aren't physical events generally. I want to do as, as much as I can because, as I said before, I think that's a vital way forward in terms of reaching and developing new audiences. The thing is that I really liked the online chat shows earlier this year. I think that's something that can run concurrently in future with live events. Yeah, they're, 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 they're very, they're, it's a very different um, format. You don't have that sort of buzz of having a live audience, so that's different. But you do have an intimacy, which, you, which, which is hard to create in, on a stage show. So, And also you can get people who maybe aren't able to physically be in the same room together in terms of the artists I mean not just the audience but you can get you know like we had for example in a previous show we had 
Um, Salim, we, we, had, we had Salim Haddad, who is a former oh, yes. prize winner, you know, who's now living, was living in Lisbon. So normally we wouldn't be able to have him easily on, on, on a stage. We'd have to arrange, you know, to get him into the country or, or wait for him to be here. And then it may well be that our, our programme date doesn't coincide with his visit. Whereas doing events digitally, you can reach, you can get people together. So it's a, it's a good way forward of having, showcasing authors and poets who, who may be a further afield. Likewise, when we had Sarah Schulman from, you know, live from New, from New York City. So, you know, we can't always do, we can't always do that in a physical sense. It's not, you, you have, you, some, sometimes once the timetable, the way given by the venue does not coincide with publishers' timetables for when their authors are visiting, for example. So it just means you've got another, another option. It's, 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 it's never going to eclipse the main thrust of Polari is still live events in the sense of physical live events. But I think going forward, there's going to be more, more hybrid going on. It won't eclipse it, but it'll become a sort of component part, another, another option. And similarly with the podcast, the podcast is always going to be something that's linked to the physical events or the, or the, or, or the other events, the online events. So it's always going to be picking up on a showcase that we've, that we've staged, whether it's been physically staged in a venue or staged via Zoom. That provides the raw material for the podcast. So I think it has a sort of symbiotic relationship going forward. I've been running Polari now since 2007. And until this last year, the only physical record I had of past events was either photographs that, that do go back to the very beginning I've had, I have photographs right from the beginning of the event in 2007. And there were a couple of short fi films that were made by people. So there were a couple of short videos where elements, you know, moments of a show or little snatches of a show were, were filmed and then put together. I, have, I think I have two or three of those. And then I have my own photo album, which is on, you know, Facebook or on my computer. But I don't, other than that, there was no, there's, there's been no record of how to, you know, sort of relive those events. And now there is, now there's a whole, a whole wealth of material that didn't exist a year ago. So going forward, that's great to have that. I think, you know, I, I think also it's, you, you still have pe people that will um, stumble up, up, across you on a, on a, on a programme for a festival or they'll happen across up, upon you on Twitter or something and they'll want to know what exactly is, is the, this event. And it's, unless they've been, it's actually quite difficult to explain it sometimes. People have preconceived ideas of what a, a literature event is going to be. And I always sort of try and explain to them that it's, think of it like a cabaret in which all of the performers happen to be writers. That's how I always try to explain it to people. But now I can, you can just say, well, go and look on YouTube, go and listen to our podcast. You can, there, there are places people can go now to get a flavour of what the event is. So th having a record of it serves a purpose in terms of having a record, but also in terms of going forward, because it gives you something that people can latch on to, to see what it is that you're inviting them to come and attend. They can, they can check it out online first. We have a birthday, a 14th birthday event at GAY Manchester on November the 18th with Rosie Garland, Dale Booten and Val Qaeda and Will Belshar on the door and possibly even performing we shall see and on december the 1st we have um a big event in london which is polari in heaven with um neil bartlett diana suami son of a tutu and adam smith who's written this wonderful book about the history of poppers that's the that, that's the one you sniff not the ones that you pop on your clothes <laughs> um so that's on December the first, World AIDS Day. So I think there'll be quite a there'll be a moments of there'll be moments of quite sort of reflection going on on that evening, I suspect, given given the occasion. But also it'll be a celebration. Um, so we've got these two events, and then that's it for this year. I mean, we're literally we were we were, met, we were supposed to deliver twenty two events for this tour. That was the original plan was twenty two events. And in actual fact, it's been more like 25 or 26, um, including including the various Polari online events as well as the physical events. And also we did we did other events in conjunction with festivals where they were hosting the event online, but we were part of it. So all in all, I mean, I've, I've kind of lost count 
totally, but it's definitely 25 or maybe more, even more um, events over the last year. So quite frankly, I'm absolutely exhausted now. Um, so it's just like that one, this one last little hurdle just to get through the next six weeks and then, and then I'm done and I'm taking a break and hopefully be able to get away if that's possible. I'd like, I'd like to go away and be in the sunshine. Well, congratulations. It's a brilliant achievement to have done that, especially under the circumstances. Thank you. Well, you know, everyone everyone pulled together. Um, I had lots of support doing it. Um, a lot of our touring partners that we've worked with before stepped up and, you know, created opportunities. And venues, the, the venues that are still open, because obviously some of the venues we plan to work with, sadly, are no longer open. But many, many of the partners we worked with before, you know, certain um, Hertfordshire libraries, for example, Edinburgh, festivals where we've where we've had a long history i mean huddersfield was our first ever polari touring event sort of north of watford basically was was huddersfield lit fest back in 2014 and we've been a regular fixture there every ever since every year we've been back and obviously the last two is is the, the festivals in march so we've now missed two physical festivals because of covid we've taken part in online events with the festival instead so, you know, if I have, I have you know, huge, huge gratitude to those people as well who've kind of kept us on their radar and stepped up and given us the opportunity to still work with them, even though they weren't running a full physical festival. Well, that's it for the time being. We've made 12 episodes of the Polari podcast. So this is the end of our first series, hopefully not the last podcast that we'll make. But this is a record of the tour that started in 2020. And during that time, we went from completely physical events to hybrid events to completely online events to hybrid events again. And now we are back to physical with a side order of hybrid. Who knows what the future holds, but this is a record of what we've been up to during that time and the wonderful people, authors and venues who who have joined Polari along the way. Thanks to Paul Burston for creating these events and for giving a bit of shape and highlights to our lives during some of the darkest times that we've endured recently. If you've enjoyed the Polari podcast, and I know some of the sound quality can be a bit rough and ready at times, such are the joys of live recording, you never quite know what you're going to get, do give us a nice rating on whatever platform that you listen to podcasts on. You can actually listen to the podcasts on YouTube. You can have them on in the background if you like. And of course, you can also find us on Spotify and Apple podcast so most of the places where you can usually listen if you're listening on another platform you'd find it more useful to have us on your phone then you can find us there too uh, i've been sophia blackwell a co-host and producer of the polari podcast and if you want to keep abreast of what's going on you can find us on twitter and also on the website polarisalon.com where paul burston will be updating you about future events both in person and online and other things that you can potentially be part of thank you you for being part of this podcast experience and we do hope that you've enjoyed them. Mm -hmm.